Hi everybody, in this video we'll be looking at some basic social engineering attacks. So social engineering is the art of exploiting human psychology rather than technical hacking techniques to gain access to buildings, systems or data. So for example, rather than trying to find and exploit a software vulnerability, a social engineer might impersonate an employee and try to trick employees into giving over their credentials or opening a malicious file or something like that. They might drop some USB sticks around a car park and hope that some employees pick them up and plug them in. Um, so there are quite a few different social engineering attack types. In this video we'll be focusing primarily on phishing and quite basic phishing ex attacks at that. So we all know the classic phishing scams that we get through email and they exploit a sense of urgency, curiosity or fear in order to try and get us to either reveal sensitive information or click on a malicious link or open a file which will then uh, infect the system. Considering that humans are considered to be the weakest link typically in security, social engineering and phishing is obviously a, a serious issue. You know, if employees aren't aware of these kinds of attacks, then it's very hard for organizations to defend against it. This video will be a little bit different to the content I typically put on YouTube. The reason I'm recording this is essentially I was asked to put together a basic phishing and social engineering attack demo for final year students, undergraduate students who are doing a secure coding module. So I figured I might as well record it as well and see if it can help anybody else at the same time. So bearing that in mind, this might be above your level or below your level, but hopefully you can find something in it that's useful anyway. I'm also re-recording this intro at the moment because I had a long rant on the last intro about YouTube removing my videos, which they seem to have resolved, so I figured I'd come back and re-record the intro. Also I noticed that there's a little white block at times around my cursor throughout the video, not not all the way through, but at certain times, and it's quite small, it shouldn't cover too much up, but I thought I'd also mention that as well. You can skip down at the bottom between the chapters if you want to skip ahead, but essentially we'll be looking at capturing some basic auth credentials in Metasploit, and then we will create a malicious PDF which we will we would be sending as a phishing email to infect the victim and then get a interpreter shell at which point we'll have a look at some different modules that we can use, how we can establish persistence and uh, dump hashes and use some different modules to scan for local vulnerabilities and things like that. And then finally we'll take a look at the social engineer toolkit. So I hadn't actually looked at this for several years myself and it's kind of me playing around with it a bit at the end but we will do the credential harvester attack and we'll look at the browser auto pwn mode and see what we can get working. Needless to say this is for educational purposes, we're learning how social engineering and phishing attacks work so that we can be aware of them and defend against them. If you're interested in this topic I would recommend checking out The Art of Deception by Kevin Mitnick and with that out of the way I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, once Metasploit's booted up, we'll see some statistics here about the available exploits and auxiliary modules, post modules, payloads, encoders, NOPs, and evasion techniques. So we can check out the help menu here. Let's run help and see what kind of commands we have. We've got develop, developer commands, credential backend commands, uh, database backend commands job commands, module commands, there's a lot of stuff here. If there's anything particularly you want to find information on, for example, there's a search function there, so if we run search, we can just type search and it'll come back with a help. We can also do help search, and that will bring back the same information. And then, uh, so for any modules, anything you're not too sure about, uh, just, just run help and you'll get, the, you'll get the info you need, or just run it without any parameters and you'll probably get the info you need as well. Uh, so we're gonna search, first of all, for HTTP basic. And this is a really, really basic example of a phishing attack using HTTP basic auth. So you can see here it's basic auth credential collector. Let's, because we want to use this module, we're going to type use and then we'll just paste that in. And whenever we use a module, we can do show options and we'll get a list of the options that are required and op options which are optional as well. So in this case, we can see this is required. It's already filled in for us. You don't need to worry about it. So if it's already filled in, you're probably ready to run it. but Let's make a couple of changes here. The first thing is our service host. So if we have a couple of different IPs, let me go and do IF config. You might have some different interfaces here. So I'm going to specify and say we want to do this on our Ethernet. So we'll set the service host. We can use autocomplete there. Paste in the IP address. And then we might want to set SSL as well. Although if we do that, bear in mind it's going to be a self-signed certificate. So it might raise more suspicion than 
not use an SSL because they're gonna get the victim's gonna get an alert saying this is a self-signed untrusted certificate do you wish to add an exception and that's a big red flag so we'll not do that in this case we have a realm so what do we want to present this authentication as so let's assume this is a really really basic attack maybe we're trying to get into somebody's Facebook or something like that obviously as a educationally we're not we're not actually trying to hack into somebody's Facebook that'd be unethical and illegal um, but if we were in a, doing a pen test or something like that and we were trying to fish some credentials off one of the employees with full authorization by the company then we might set the realm here let's set the realm to I'm gonna put Facebook login obviously it's gonna no, look nothing like a Facebook login so that's where the social engineering comes in that's where we need to persuade the victim to entering their credentials into this even though everything about it should be telling them don't put your login details in here uh, we can also set the URI path so let's set that to something like URI path um, slash login and is there anything else uh, I think that looks good we can set the redirect URL as well so let's do set redirect URL to facebook.com alright and we can just go and show, show the options just make sure we've got everything in as we as we want it and then we can run the server so now it's given us a URL that this is running on and essentially then we would pass this URL to the victim so maybe we would send out a phishing email or that looks like it's coming from Facebook or something like that maybe we would just provide the URL to the victim so we'll go over to I've got a Windows XP system here a vulnerable system with some vulnerable plugins and things like that I was testing out the social engineer toolkit with this operating system and with a Windows 7 operating system that I used to use for tracking exploit kits but for some reason I, was, I wasn't able to get the an, a shell using any of the methods in there I tried using the browser ponin methods I tried using phishing and I wasn't able to get it working so we'll have a look at that at the end anyway maybe somebody can tell me what I'm doing wrong or what the bug is so we give this to the victim they open the link and they see Facebook login requires a username and password now obviously this doesn't look anything like Facebook and this, this server doesn't look like Facebook so this could be a bit more realistic but assuming that we have um, emailed the victim with a convincing enough email or maybe we have them on the phone and we're saying okay you just need to enter in your credentials here and that'll reset your password or you need to first put in your current password so say they put in crypto and crypto and then you tell them okay click OK and then you'll go through to Facebook and now I want you to try and just log in so they go through to Facebook we're no longer capturing this traffic this is just them being redirected they go and log in as normal and see uh, my password is actually working I'm not too sure what that password box was about but on our Kali system if we go back we'll see that a user attempted to authenticate with that login box with the credentials crypto crypto and then they were redirected to facebook.com so now we can take those credentials and we can go and log in as a user and then presumably change the password and stuff like that so that's a really really basic phishing example wouldn't really be used in practice typically what you would do there is you would actually create a website that looks like Facebook so you can clone the website there's actually a feature to do that in the social engineer toolkit and then you can you know maybe you would set up a domain with a very similar sound and domain name and you would do something similar so it actually looks like Facebook the user puts in their Facebook credentials and then what you could do rather than just redirecting them to Facebook where they'll have to log in again and that would again raise suspicion because they just think well I just I just logged in there why is it asking me to log in again you could automate that so if you if you have a fake Facebook page and the user puts in their username and password you have their username and password which means you can redirect them to facebook.com but you can also log them in with the credentials that they just entered so the whole transition between the attack site and the actual benign site is is um, invisible so that's a really basic example let's now have a look at creating a malicious PDF and see how we could actually get control of a user system so I'm gonna search we'll search for name PDF and you can go by the ranks here as well you see we've got a couple of excellent ones one is the Adobe PDF embedded EXE social engineering so let's take that copy we'll use 
and then we want to show the options, see what we need to enter in here. By default, the file name is evil.pdf, so obviously that doesn't sound too benign. So we'll change that. We'll set file name to payslip.pdf. You could also modify the launch message. You could modify the template. So in an actual example, you could imagine that maybe you're doing a pen test against an organization and they normally give out their payslips through these PDFs. You could you could use an actual payslip from that company as the template. So that's what the victim will see whenever they open it up. And then we also have this launch message. So the launch message to view the encrypted content, please tick do not show this message again and press open. So that might be changed to something else as well to say something like uh, we're currently updating our payslip generation system. Um, if you get any false positives from your antivirus, please ignore and um, you know click to open. Something like that. So let's see what else do we need to change here. We've already got the payload set up. It's set up to use Windows Meterpreter Reverse TCP, which is good. We'll leave that. Um, here it's set to no handler will be created. That's fine. We'll create a handler ourselves. No worries. So let's try and run that. It's created this payslip.pdf in our root directory. So let's copy that. Let's copy it over to our desktop and now we need to set up the payload so we're gonna do use exploit multi handler and then it's set at the moment to generic shell so we need to say um, set payload to windows windows meterpreter reverse tcp show options we also need to set our L host, so we'll set L host. In this case, hopefully, I'll be able to just auto complete, which I can. And then we need to make sure it's on the right port as well. We just left it on the default 444 port, so that should be fine. So if we didn't run that, then essentially the victim would open the PDF. It would try to make a connection back to this IP address on this port to open up the interpreter shell. And this, there's no listener here, so it would just do nothing really. Um, so now that that's running, we need to get this payslip over to the victim system. So this might be a case of, in an actual pen test, it's probably going to be a case of sending this in an email, and you would have an email looking like it's coming from HR with your payslip and stuff like that. In our example, I don't have the email set up on these systems, and I don't. So we'll do another example, which is kind of realistic as well. Let's do Python, not in this, not for the payslip maybe, but for a social engineering attack. So we'll do Python uh, dash m htp dot server and I'm going to run this port 1337 so now we're running our this directory as a web server so if we go back to what's the IP address again let me grab the IP so if we go back to our Windows system now and we'll go HTTP port 1337 payslip.pdf we get the payslip, we'll save it, and we get this message. And we were told to view the encrypted content, please tick do not show this message again. So we'll tick that and then press open. So we'll do that as well. Open, okay. Where's my payslip? Okay, that's weird. It's a blank page. And then if we go back to our Kali or Parrot or whatever Linux system you're using here, you'll see that we've actually got a interpreter shell open. So if we do get UID, we'll see that we're logged in as admin on that Windows machine. So let's look at some of the things that we can do in Meterpreter. So if if we had just set that up to use just the generic shell, then we can we can get a shell here from Meterpreter. Just type shell, hit enter, and this this would be us basically in the command prompt on that Windows system, right? So we can run the directories, we can do all of our usual stuff, but it's not quite as powerful as having access to this Meterpreter shell. So in Meterpreter, we can just do ps here, get a list of all the processes. We can actually let's look at the help section look at help here's the different commands that we have available to us and if there are any commands that we want more information on so in here you see we can get around the file system while using Linux commands which is quite handy we can download files we can upload files we can um, we can look at the network configurations we can kill processes clear the event log execute commands steal tokens, reboot the system. So there's a lot of cool stuff we can do here. We can 
uh, capture keystrokes, we can get a screenshot of the desktop, we can start listening on the, on the mic or recording the webcam, we can play an audio file on the system just to maybe freak them out. We can get systems to try and elevate, elevate the privileges, so it'll run through a, a few different techniques to try and get system access. We can do hash dump to dump the contents, uh, etc. So if there's something here we want more information on, let's do help hash dump. Oh, there is no help for that, okay. Um, help get system. Okay, I'm picking all things that don't have help available. Let's do... Alright, we'll do help migrate. And you'll see here then it'll give you the, the syntax here. So we need to migrate on whatever process ID we want to migrate to. So often, maybe not in this case, but if, normally if you run this process command, we'll have we'll actually see a binary here with maybe some randomly named binary which is actually our malware so we might want to migrate to another process that's not likely to be killed by the antivirus or, or by the the user suspecting that there's something going on with that so we might try to move to the explore let's go migrate 3804 oops that was not the right one <laughs> non-existent process okay so we can try to migrate migration completed successfully so now we're in the so they actually have to kill IE explore here in order to actually we should have done that to explorer.exe I don't know what I was thinking there but um, that's fine also you also want to consider what privileges the process has and what architecture it is so sometimes you might get a shell and it's a 32-bit shell but in order to get full in order to get full functionality we might want to move over to a 64-bit process um, you can see actually we have this template.pdf running here as well. Let's try and run something that's running as system because we don't have system access. Let's try and migrate to 852. Okay, it migrated successfully there. Okay, that's fine. And we can look at some post modules. We can do run post. Um, and you can just hit yes to get a list of all the different types of commands here. I'm going to go run post windows gather credentials and see what we have available to us. So you can see we can gather different types of credentials here. Uh, we can go for credential correct collector. Let's try and run that. And you'll see it's actually come back with all the hashes for the various um, accounts as well. We could have also done hash dump. Sometimes if we weren't a privileged user there then um, there's a couple of things we could do. We could try and run this. Let's do get UID again. So we could try and run. Oh, we're yeah, we're we're already in a system there now. Okay, we were admin. I guess that was us uh, swapping the process. But if we weren't system, we could do this get system command, and it would try some different techniques to see if it can actually just escalate the privileges to system. Let's see what else we can do there. If we do our um, gather. We can also check VM here as well to see if we're inside a virtual machine. So the person we're trying to do the social engineering attack on might actually be a malware analyst who's trying to analyze the malware or is trying to track down a threat actor or something like that. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different options in there. Let's um, let's move on to get persistence as well. So let's do help persistence. Oh, okay. Let's run persistence. Can I do help dash help there? Okay. This is depreciated. So you should try and use exploit local. Okay run exploit so we can run exploit windows local persistence from I guess we'd need to background this session first um, but we can still use the old syntax the old syntax would have been to say run persistence and then we can say dash u dash p let's say 1337 and this is actually going to set up persistence so that every time the system reboots it's going to try and connect back to our IP address on port 1337 so as long as we have a, a listener opening open waiting for a connection from the interpreter payload then we'll we'll get we'll get a shell every time the system reboots 
which is pretty cool. So what else can we do? Let's let's grab that screenshot as well. We had the screenshot option. So if we grab a screenshot, it saves it to our desktop. Let's display that. And you can see there we've got the screenshot of the desktop. We could run the key scan. Let's do key scan start. And it's starting to sniff the keystrokes. Let's go back to our system here and we could go to facebook.com go and try and log in and that'll attempt to log us in if we go back to our system here and say key scan we don't have to stop it but I'm gonna stop it here first well, let's dump it first key scan dump and it oh, okay it didn't actually dump anything Uh, that's strange. Let me do that again. Key scan start. Let's go back. Crypto, crypto. That's strange. The last time I tested that out, it worked okay. Dump. No, alright, that's weird. Last time this worked for me fine. I'm not too sure what's going on there. Um, that's fine though. Let's see what else we can do here. We'll run help. And let's actually take a look at some of the plugin modules. So if we go and uh, use, type use and then hit tab and you'll get a list of some plugins that we can use here. So we can, we can add in PowerShell, Python, Sniffer, Kiwi, which is Mimikatz. So let's do use Kiwi. It loads the extension and then uh, let's type help again. Type help, and it now has the list of the Kiwi commands, so we can run creds all, and it's going to try. Oh, we lost our shell. System is being shut down. Windows must now restart up because it unexpectedly. Okay, that was not planned. Shutdown was initiated by NT Authority System. Okay, maybe there might have been something to do with maybe one of the, s the processes I migrated to. All right, let me get this restarted and uh, reconnected. One second. Let's actually see here if we can set the uh, payload. Let's show options, set the L port to one three three seven and run. Oh, we're already using that for our HTTP. Let's run that again. I'm just wondering if whenever this boots up, oh, it's probably too late now, it already booted up. Okay, I was just, um, because we set up that persistence last time, but let's not worry about it. We'll put that back to 4444. We'll run that again, and we'll just go and open up the PDF document again. Open up the PDF. Oh, it's not a supported file now. Interesting. <laughs> All right, let's delete that. Let's go to our Internet Explorer again. Let's go back and do our Python HTTP server. Need to grab that IP. HTTP. Oh, it's still saved. Great. Save it. Open it. And let's go back. We've got a shell back. All right, cool. What were we doing? We were using Kiwi. Use Kiwi, help, and then that's pretty cool. Wi-Fi list, password change. We can change the passwords. We can execute an arbitrary command. Use a Kerberos ticket. Create a golden Kerberos ticket. Let's just run here. Creds all. And we're not running a system, so execution may fail. So let's use get. Let's actually check our get get UID. We're currently running as admin. Let's do. In fact, instead of let's do get system, let's let me quickly show how we can check for local privilege escalation exploits. We're currently admin, but in some cases we might be an even lower privilege user. We might just be trying to get up to admin first before we try to get root or system access. So we can do here run post 
multi, because we can do this on different architectures. Recon, let's see what options we actually have here. All right, we don't have too much. Local exploit suggester. And this is going to scan the system and see what kind of local privilege escalation exploits might work on the system. So quite often these are quite generic and, you know, um, in doing a pen test you might run through a series of them. It's, it's not too reliable, basically. So let's try and run through a couple of them here and see if see if we can escalate the privileges. We'll also look into how we can manage sessions as well then because in order to test out one of these exploits we're gonna you can see there are 35 exploits being tried. Services running could not be validated so you get um, some of these uh, these are some of the local exploits we can try so if we wanted to try one of these let's I'm gonna copy this we need to background our session, so we do background, and then we can, if we want to look at our sessions, we can type sessions, it'll show what sessions we have, and then we can do help again, help sessions, and this will tell us how we can jump between sessions and background them and things like that. So we've got a session, let's say we want to use this local exploit now, and it's defaulted to another payload, we'll show options. We need to set the session, so set session, in this case session 2, because we had that first session which got killed um, for some reason. We'll use a different port, because we're already using port 4444, so I'll do 4445. And, okay, uh, exploit target, alright, that all looks good. So now, if we do run, and exploit was completed but no session was created. So we might want to try another one of these payloads. Uh, I'm trying to think what's a reliable one. Uh, let's try this. Show options, hopefully it's kept all of our options the same. No, alright, so we need to set the session to session 2 and set the L port to 4445. We'll run this see it's trying to exploit, it's injecting the payload, it's done, it's verifi verify privileges manually or get UID to verify, okay but it didn't actually create a session there so okay we'll try one more of those local exploits try the proxy or reflection, let's try this reflection Uh, it sets the default payload again. All right, set session two. We'll set the L port to four 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 five, and then run that. Waiting for hopefully privileged payload execution, and there we go. We've got a third meterpreter session. Let's do get UID, and we're still an admin, so that didn't actually help at all. All right, so I'm going to run get system. In fact, just before I do that, let me show. We can now background that. We can now have a look at our sessions, and we have two different sessions running. So let's go into sessions-i3, that's our new session. And you can see that it's on a different port here. And then we can, let's just do get system. And now if we do get UID, we'll see that we are MT authority system, which means if we are, if we use Kiwi, and then check the help and now do creds all we'll see that oh, it actually killed the session is this okay didn't crash that time okay let's see sessions we still have our session 2 sessions dash i2 we're interacting with it now we are still an admin here, so we'll do get system. I'm also going to maybe migrate the process. Let's migrate to... Why is explorer.exe not there? Okay, I'm not going to do that. I'll leave that. We already have Kiwi here. Help. Creds. All. And all right, there we go. We got our, we got our creds. So it's come back. The passwords. We don't actually have any passwords. They're all set to um, 
just be blank and then we have our hashes and stuff there as well. Alright cool, so that's a demonstration of using the Mimikatz plugin. Let's see what other plugins we can check out as well. So we can, again we'll check the use option here. Let's have a look and see what we've actually got. Incognito. Let's do help again. Incognito, so we can add users. Alright, so we might want to add a new user. What else can we do? We can use PowerShell. And help again. And this will allow us to execute PowerShell commands. It will allow us to import scripts. So we could look at importing Powersploit maybe, which has some really good uh, privilege escalation techniques in it. We can get a PowerShell shell if we want, if we want to drop sh straight into a shell. Uh, what else do we have there? We can use sniffer, help again. And the sniffer, so we can actually sniff interfaces there by looks of it. We can set up, let's do help sniffer start. Okay. Sniffer start dash h. I'm just wondering what the parameters are. Okay, so it takes an interface ID a packet buffer. So we can actually specify what interface on the system we want to capture the traffic from. That's pretty cool. We can start and stop that and we can dump all the packet captures that have been received so far into a all the packets that have been received so far into a PCAP file. So that's pretty cool. Um, use PE injector. Uh, help again. Okay, so we can inject shellcode into a given executable. So you can get an idea once you start to load in these plugins uh, how powerful the interpreter shell can be. Even with the default commands here, we have a lot of things available. So we can screen share, we can watch a remote user's desktop in real time. We can uh, basically do anything that the, that the user could do on the system and, and more uh, and automate a lot of that. So. Yeah, um, if you're if you're checking out Meterpreter, check out those plugins. Remember as well, you can run a lot of different post modules. See, there's 231 possibilities here, so you can go through and just play around with some of these. We can enumerate the networks. We can enumerate uh, different services. You can see here and uh, enumerate SNMP and enumerate uh, mounts. We can check USB device histories. Um, a lot of different things. And I think that'll do it for the Meterpreter post exploitation demo. What I'll do now is move on to testing out. I'm going to close Meterpreter, uh, the Meterpreter. I'm going to move on to testing out the Social Engineer Toolkit, which uh, in the last couple of last couple of times I played around with that, I wasn't able to get anything at all working. But we'll have a look at what the options are, what should be available, and maybe if you're watching this video and you, and you have more experience with the social engineer toolkit than me you'll be able to tell me what's going wrong for me but uh, it, it used to work for me I remember doing demos with it you know a good few years ago and we were able to clone websites and use them for phishing and use them for uh, use them as exploits so actually using browser exploits in cloned websites and getting a shell back but everything I've been trying uh, recently isn't working so uh, let's take a look at it now anyway so I'm going to go and check out the home page first. This, is, this tool's by TrustedSec. So we'll just open up the home page and that'll give us a little bit of info about it and how to get it set up. So we can git clone it here or we can go and view it on git as well. And this was created by Dave Kennedy, founder of TrustedSec, an open source Python driven tool aimed at penetration testing around social engineering. Been presented at Black Hat. DerbyCon, DEFCON and SHMUCON so you can go and check out those videos they're quite old now and I think a lot of the stuff that did work on there is probably not going to work now but you can see here in terms of the updating of this it seems pretty it doesn't really seem to be getting too much maintenance now so let's run through what we need to anyway to get this set up I'm going to clone this to the desktop and we'll go into the SE toolkit it wants us to install these so I'm gonna set I'm gonna use my Python 3 
virtual environment and then do pip install dash r requirements can install whatever's needed and then we just need to run python setup All right, so that's set up. We'll do python setup.py. It's all right. It's trying to install those anyway, and it wants to set up a shortcut, so it's going to need sudo privileges. I'll just give it that. All right, that's it done. Now it just says run se toolkit to start the social engineering toolkit. So let's do that. Oh, we need to run it as root. So we run that. We get some terms and conditions here. We need to use this purely for good and not evil. So, yep, we're going to do that. Sure. All right, so we boot this up. We've got our uh, different options available to us. The main menu, so we can do social engineering attacks, penetration testing, third party modules, and then updates and config and stuff like that. So, let's start off with the social engineering attacks section where we can do spear phishing, website attacks, infectious media generator, create payload and listener. Okay. So let's have a look first of all at the website attack vectors. So these are basically using browser based exploits. So you have different exploits available here. The credential harvester, I guess we'll just clone a, yes, yeah, so we can clone a website that has a username and password field and harvest all the information. Let's try that first of all. So this sounds a bit a bit like what we did with Metasploit to begin with, the basic HTTP auth, but a more realistic example where rather than a pop-up box, a generic HTTP auth pop-up box, we're actually going to use the username and password field of the website. So let's try it out. We'll go to three and then we can import our own. We can use some templates. Let's actually have a look at the templates. Does it... Okay, it doesn't... Um, I thought it was going to give a list of some different ones there. Okay, let's go back into that. It was spear phishing. Was it spear phishing? No, we were in website attack vectors. You can hit Control and C to go back to the main menu. So we're in. Oh wait, we weren't in. We were in social engineering attacks, and then we were in website attack vectors, right? Yeah. Okay, there we go. And we've got the credential harvester attack method, so three. I'm going to do the site cloner. Let's try and clone Facebook here if we can. IP address for the post back. So this is going to be our IP address. Okay, so now we want to use the HTTP. It also supports HTTPS. Okay, so let's do face HTTPS www.facebook.com going to try and clone this login.facebook.com okay best way to use this attack is if the username and password form fields are available regardless it will capture all posts on a website okay and credential harvester is running on port 80 information will be displayed to you as it arrives below okay has it given us a URL I'm not sure am I supposed to be waiting for something there or are they waiting for me? Oh, okay. It went straight to Facebook. Cool. Right. That's that's good. All right. We'll type in here crypto and crypto login, say yes. And it's actually redirected us to Facebook there, you'll see. But if we go back to our, if we go back to our, um, social engineer toolkit here we'll see that the post request actually went through here and we can see that the email we actually entered in the username crypto and the password crypto as well and we were able to harvest those credentials all right so that worked actually pretty well it worked with a HTTPS site as well and it also redirected to Facebook afterwards what would be cool is if it also took the username and password and logged into Facebook so this was all kind of seamless but um, that seems to be working quite well in general anyway. All right, cool. Let's see what else we can do. Let's check out, we could have a look multi-attack method or Metasploit browser exploit method. We could create a Java applet as well. I'm going to do, let's do the multi-attack and site cloner. We'll do the same again. We'll say no, we're not using port forwarding. 
Alright, that's our local host. And now the website we want to clone, we'll just do the same again. Picking on Facebook today. And then what attacks do we want to use? I'm going to use them all. Tactical Nuke or Hail Mary. And let's see what happens here. It's going to clone the website. It's injecting iframes for the MSF attack. What payload do you want to generate? I'm going to leave these at the default so it'll be memory injection. Port 443, that's fine by me. Meterpreter, reverse TCP. Oh, it's set to HTTPS at the moment. I'm going to set that to just set that to one just in case. And uh, we'll just set that to two, use the built in. Here's the list of exploits that we can attempt to use. So I am running a vulnerable Windows XP system with an old version of Internet Explorer on it and some old plugins, but um, I do remember trying this before and not having any luck. So let's try it. I'm going to do. I'm going to use the 46 just because. <laughs> let's just throw everything at it and see if something works. The site has been moved. Web server is now listening. It's now going to load up our Metasploit framework. And it's running this as a background job. Starting exploit modules. Do we need to hit run here? It didn't give. I was kind of expecting to see. I was running this background job. Okay, running the background. Okay, so let's go. Did it give us a URL to go to? Ah, here we go. It's starting to starting to produce some URLs now. It's starting these servers. So each of these exploits is on a different service and on a different URI. Sorry. So we could we could test those out one by one. But I believe if we let this complete, it's just going to give us a URL right here, local IP. So this is the URL. If we were to send this in an email to the victim or somehow get them to click on this, it's going to essentially run through each of these exploits and try to get us a reverse shell. So I'm going to go over to our victim's machine here. We'll enter that URL. Let's just agree to anything it asks us. And let's also just check as well. Can we... If we try to view the source here, oh, you can see it's tried to throw these exploits there. You can see there's our IP address of the Windows system 1.134. It's tried to throw all of these exploits in, and it doesn't look like it has achieved a shell. Let's go back and just try that again. It does try to load up there, but I'm not able to view the source. That's interesting. Ah, okay. Um, because I loaded that again, it looks like it's just trying to run through all of those same exploits again. It's responding with these 14 exploits. All the Java ones there, by the looks of it. Uh, but you can see that it's not actually spawned as a shell yet. So uh, presumably this is just down to my uh, the the honeypot system I have set up there. I did have a better Windows Seven system with a lot of which I've set up for exploit kit tracking, which had a lot of anti-analysis stuff. Um, done to it to make sure that it wasn't detectable as a VM and it had a lot of vulnerable stuff on it but uh, I, d I can't find my working version of it, it's been a couple of years so alright doesn't look like it's gonna get us a shell here anyway but we didn't help that I left the page let me just one more time let's run that see it's loading we're gonna see any redirections occurring here can see it's throwing all the exploits here anyway. In an actual exploit kit attack, this is kind of you know a, a crude example of an, an actual exploit kit, kit attack where maybe you would visit a legitimate website which has either been hacked or has a malicious 
advertisement or something on it and maybe in that advertisement there'll be a little piece of code which redirects to another site which redirects to another site which redirects to another site and you go through this chain of redirections without actually maybe seeing anything happen in the browser you'll go through this chain of redirections and then at some point you'll get to a landing page where the um, the landing page will basically scan your system to see what operating system what browser what plugins you're using and it'll look to see what co what corresponding exploits it has, what exploits it has that match those vulnerable software versions. If it finds some, it'll try and queue them, and it'll run each one until it gets uh, until it until the exploit is successful, and then maybe it'll drop some ransomware or a keylogger or something like that. If it fails or if the system's not vulnerable, it'll normally just do nothing or redirect to a benign page, so that tracking can be quite difficult. It also exploit kits typically have quite good evasion and anti-analysis techniques so if they're running inside a VM they'll normally not even try to run any exploits and um, they'll only even if even if you've got a good honeypot and you go to visit the, the exploit kit it'll only try to exploit once so if you if the exploit fails or if you want to test it again you'll actually have to get a new IP address in order to in order to test it again so they can be quite tricky to to analyze in that way but yeah it doesn't look like it's getting us a shell here anyway let's exit this um, let's go back and see what else we can do so we'll go back to the main menu we have some PowerShell attack vectors here let's have a quick look at that PowerShell so we can just um, use these to generate the shells um, alright go back we have a QR code generator so so generate create a QR code for whatever URL you want so we could create a malicious URL like in those examples you just did and then use that to generate a QR code and then send that to the victim that's pretty cool we have the infectious media generator let's have a look so this will create a we can create a malicious USB or CD or DVD with an auto run file in it so that if the victim enters that, so if you're doing a pen test, you maybe drop some USB sticks around a, a company's um, car park or something like that. Employees go and pick them up and see who does this belong to. We'll plug it in and find out, see if there's some identifiable information on it. And as soon as they plug it in, if auto run is enabled, it's just going to execute straight away the uh, malicious payload that we've put in. Uh, that's pretty cool. We have wireless access point attack vectors as well. Let's go back to that. So we can set up a malicious access point by the looks of it. Okay, it's going to use these modules, these applications to do that. Yeah, okay. That's pretty cool as well. I don't actually have wireless on this system, so we're not going to be able to do that. You can see that this was not detected either. Let's go back. And the last thing we'll look at then is the email. As I said before, I didn't set up. I haven't set up like an email server. I haven't set this up to send emails back and forward. And I, I know you were able to do this with a Gmail before. You could just send the Gmail email address and password. But I'm not too sure how how well it works now. But we can create, we can perform a mass mail attack. We can create a file format payload. We can create a social engineering template. Let's get an idea. Enter name as an author. All right. So we can yeah. We're basically creating a phishing email here. I'm going to just go back there. We have the mass mail attack, so we can go in here and again, we've got payloads. What do we want to send it out to? Let's just go with the defaults. Default. Default. Oh, okay. Maybe it created it there. I'm not too sure. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think that'll do it for the video. I hope, um, I hope this has been useful. Um, the social engineering toolkit demo went a bit better than I expected. I didn't expect really to whenever I was trying to run this previously I was getting a lot of errors about strings and bytes which looked like they were to do with Python 3 um, but we didn't see any errors there which is which is good I guess um, but yeah I hope you've enjoyed this video if you have any questions or comments if you have any cool techniques or tools that I should check out in future videos do let me know let me know down below thanks